There's not many places on this planet that is truly untamed and unexplored. The ocean is one, and in terms of land masses, the Antarctic is the other. It's a hard job. It's 24-7. It is an extreme environment. It's a very harsh place to work. It's a very dangerous place to work. But I love adventure. It's the most dramatic continent on the planet. The old explorers called it the land of the gods. In my lifetime, that whole area of Earth has changed. The winter sea ice season is 90 days short. We have seen peninsulas turn into islands, islands pop out from under glaciers, and we have seen radical changes in the seabird populations. We camp out here for five days. We've been studying the penguins here for over a decade. Things that are happening down here will start happening also in other areas around the world. It's not just a localized issue, it's a world issue. So right out there, I just saw a humpback whale blow. If you guys see any other whales, uh, let us know. What we would like to do is start understanding more about the roles of marine mammals in the Antarctic ecosystem. I think that's our 25th biopsy. There's pack ice here, which could slow us down. The biggest concern I have is if that load does push us that ice in, get us trapped. We're sitting there and the wind blows all of this ice back this way. A swinging door that just slammed shut on us down there. We don't want that. So the buzzer you hear right now is the warning signal that we're just about to hit the bottom. Holy crap. Yeah, we, just, I, we almost hit I the bottom. It. We're 10,000 miles from our labs at home, so we never know when there's going to be a surprise out there. These transmitters tells us how long they're gone. So our data tells us how easy is it for them to go feed. New technologies as we go forward are going to be the absolute key to study this ocean. I feel like what we're doing is important work. It's work that needs to be done. And it's almost like I don't have a choice. <laughs> I, need, I need to do this. I mean, there is a complete sense of responsibility. We can't mess this up. I want to understand where the system is going to give the next generation the best leg up to prepare for it. This is where I work. This is my home for about two months every year, and I've been down there about 20 years. So a, your almost entire college career I've spent on this ship. And why I'm here today is to actually ask for your help, because this is the canary in the coal mine of your world that's coming. And I'm a nerd. I'm a geek. I love the hacker talk, because I can totally relate to it. But what I do know is the nerds and geeks sometimes don't get the public exposure for issues that are going to affect the next generations to come. So why do you care about my office? Well, we live on an ocean planet. As humans, we live on land, and that's sort of our perception. This entire planet is really shaped by the ocean. Half the oxygen you breathe bubbles out of the ocean. The climate that drives everything is because of the ocean. As the Earth rotates around and you're at nighttime not facing the sun, why doesn't the Earth freeze? It's because the ocean is the heat reservoir for the planet. All commerce, everything you've bought that's been come from another country has been shipped largely through the ocean. The ocean affects everything in your life. Even if you live far away from land, what this map shows is essentially temperature anomalies over time. Oops. The green on the land is essentially plant growth. And the amount of plant growth globally is driven by the temperature of the ocean. And uh, so you may live in the Midwest. Your wheat production is directly dependent on what is the slope of the Pacific Ocean. It is the driver of everything. 
It's largely unexplored. What's this a picture of? You put this up in front of students and they'll say it's a picture of the universe. This is the life in one drop of ocean water. These are marine viruses. They're the most abundant, most rapidly form of life on Earth. And when I was a graduate student, I'm not that old, um, I was told marine viruses didn't exist. So we're actually at such a basic level of discovery that we don't even know what is the most abundant form of life on planet Earth. The problem is, is the ocean is changing. Over time here, over decades, this is uh, temperatures in the deep ocean, and this is essentially the heat reservoir of the planet. And as humans have industrialized and extracted the carbon buried in the planet that took 10 million years to make, we've released in 200, it's essentially changed the balance of how elements and heat flow on Earth. And even if we shut down all fossil fuel emissions today, which we're not going to do, the heat we've already built up in the deep sea will ensure that the planet will continue to warm for 150 years. That experiment's already been done. So part of the reason to come here and talk to you across all persuasions is this is a snapshot of the world you're going to live and lead. The chemistry of the ocean is changing. It's becoming more acidic. There are huge swaths where now along the west coast of the United States, low oxygen water bubbles up along the coastlines. And it has a huge impact on the biology. And the biology is changing. This is temperature trends where I work along the West Antarctic Peninsula. And the main one here, the Adelie penguin, this is the collapse at Palmer Station. By the time some of you graduate, it's likely that Adelie penguins will be gone from Palmer Station. That hasn't happened in about 50,000 years. So the ocean's changing, it's changing rapidly. <laughs> We need to work in it. This is my office. And it's very difficult to work in this office. Because it's hard to even stand up. That's crossing the Drake Passage. During a good storm, the waves are about 60 feet. And a boat, even a nice research vessel, moves at the speed of a 10-speed bike. So it's a hard place to work. We need lots of people to study it. But I'm having a hard time getting people to actually want to become a marine scientist. And actually, if you look at it globally, we don't have enough scientists and engineers. We can't compete against the MBA, against all these other social things that are a lot sexy. And I don't understand it. Because science is the best job on the planet. I don't have a job. I have a hobby. My job is to go out and explore. And on top of it, if I'm an ocean scientist, you know, this is actually what you get to do in your office. Those are basking charts off the uh, Santa Barbara Channel. Um, when I do my work, there's physical adventure. You know, and um, at least for me, that's a great attraction. And it is dangerous. This ship is about 30 feet above the waterline. And that's the wave that's about to uh, hit the uh, technician right in the chest. He's strapped in, don't worry. Um, and it is physically laborious. I've broken eight ribs, cracked my skull, 10 fingers, three toes, nose, and uh, an arm, working in my moving office. On the other hand, I've seen things that no one else has been able to see. And the revolution is now beginning, because in the old days, five years ago, only the people on the ships could be part of the experience. So when I was an undergraduate, graduating and finding out where I was going to go to graduate school, I was working down in Antarctica. And I found out I was going to go to graduate school talking on a ham radio at Palmer Station in that room there with those people. Now if you go into the future because of global telecommunications, <laughs> Every one of you can be at sea 365 days a year. And this was an example where we deployed a robot. It flew in. I was on the ship. It was controlled here on Seb's campus. 
um, to be picked up by the British by this guy here. And he essentially timed the pickup with the Brits as he was going on a date in New York City and he had to move up the pickup date because he didn't want his phone to you know, crash when he was in Lincoln Tunnel. You can be anywhere on earth exploring from your seat today. That is a revolution we're still trying to figure out on how to utilize. The problem is, is we got a lot of important stuff to do. It's gonna affect the world your kids live in. And scientists like me sometimes are really bad communicators. So unless I get trained, this is how I act for a cup of coffee. You know, and the problem is, is we're very passionate about what we do, but if we can't translate that out to the general public, who cares if it has no impact? And a few years ago, the group of us realized we needed to have a bigger impact. And the first thing you gotta do when you realize there's a limitation is maybe know that you're not gonna be able to solve it and you have to go to someone else to solve. And so we went to the film school. And so I'm gonna hand off to my co-partner, Dina, because she's the one translating my work. So I am incredibly honored to be on the stage here with Oscar and more honored to have had a working relationship with him for the last six years. This is uh, Oscar in our Rector Center for Digital Filmmaking. And he is explaining the West Antarctic ecosystem and the climate change there to my film students. And what you see here at this moment is an intersection between two cultures, right? Two cultures with different languages and different ways of organizing information. Scientists, of course, are trained to speak in scientific terms, but also to look at the word of world objectively for objective truths. Now, artists, storytellers, we work with emotional truths. We work with characters and narratives, and, and we try to reach a large audience by connecting the audience to the people in our stories. So this is a pretty special moment. I think, because it's really showing this space of interdisciplinary collaboration. And what it is, is, is it's a process, right? Because this innovative process of filmmaking that's allowing the art students to engage in science learning through direct and long-term engagement with the scientists, this is an innovative way of working, and that allows for innovative products that embed important science concepts that reach a large audience, and that's really, really important. We met in 2009 because I was invited to their marine science department where I met with Oscar and Scott Glenn and they were tasked with navigating this eight foot autonomous robot across the Atlantic Ocean. And there was a huge urgency, we have to understand our rapidly changing ocean and this was an engineering test to see if, if new ocean technologies could be heavily involved in helping us collect data and understand and document the ocean because, of course, the ocean is a huge driver of climate change. Now, when I first went there, I didn't really understand what they were saying. They were speaking so fast, they were so animated, and then they brought me into their glider lab, and, and I got it. I got what they were doing. I got that the, the stakes were really, really high. They were passionate. They were driven. They were risk takers. They knew there was only a 5% chance this was going to work, and they all seemed a little bit crazy, and I thought, this is perfect for a, fl a film story. Now, to make a long, a long story short, um, seven of my students and I, over a year and a half, we filmed Oscar and his team navigating this autonomous robot across the Atlantic. It took us to Spain and Portugal, to the Azores, uh, to the Virgin Islands, and it was a success. 5% chance of making it, they made it. And it wound up in the Smithsonian, uh, in Sun Ocean Hall, and our film was actually part of that exhibit. But maybe most importantly, I don't know if you can see this, we made a compelling story that had important science in it and also showed scientists as passionate, driven, human, likable, caring, adventurous, and it, it reached a potential audience of 180 million people. Success, right? Well, why don't we stop there? We're not gonna stop there because we learned so much in the process of making the film. The product was fantastic. We're super proud of it. It won 10 film festival awards. And it also uh, had a screening at the, uh, at, the, at the Smithsonian and premiered at the Blue Ocean Film Festival. But what we learned was the power of storytelling. 
not storytelling only as a way of communicating science to a large audience. We all kind of knew that was true and that was important, but more importantly, the process of storytelling. And in this case, it was connecting our non-science students to science through the act of science storytelling and direct engagement and trusting relationships with really compelling world-renowned researchers like Oscar, who also we were going to take the time and work closely with our film students in order to communicate their science to them. So there was this translational moment and space, uh, which then developed into our film program in Mason Gross. Now, you may ask, you know, are scientists really good subject for narrative? Because, of course, the stereotype of scientists, as Oscar shared with us, is, is the nerd in the, in the lab with a test tube and somewhat antisocial. And, and that's not at all the case. Of course, that's one of the things we need to break as filmmakers and as artists, especially if we want to engage more people in science learning. And, and frankly, we need to. So why are uh, scientists good subjects for narratives? A, a storyteller can see the scientific process as actually a perfect fit for the narrative arc, right? Because a narrative always starts with a main character with a want and a goal. And then there has to be the challenges to reaching those goals. And a narrative has to be a process over time. You have to see a character in pursuit of that goal, trying to reach that goal, learning, struggling, and there has to be change over time. So again, our storytellers, we see the scientific process which of course starts with a question, right? Which is the hypothesis. And we see that as the dramatic question in a science-based narrative. Now we also see scientists as main characters in search of goals that are larger than themselves. And however you want to interpret that, uh, this, this is sort of the hero's journey. If, if someone is pursuing a goal that's bigger than themselves, searching for cancer, searching for an answer for cancer, searching for uh, uh, information about climate change research so that we can better prepare and mitigate climate change. These are goals that are bigger than themselves and it makes them likable and it also makes obviously the challenges uh, hard to, um, great challenges, goals that are hard to reach, but also big risks uh, at stake if they don't reach those goals. Right, the process again of testing a hypothesis is, uh, is what becomes the, the part of the narrative arc that is considered the challenges to reaching those goals. And we call these science discovery narratives, which filmmakers shape using control over cinematography, narrative form, um, film language, and control of film language as a way to share and express the scientific process to a larger, a larger audience. Now what we do in our film center, right, is we're using film language as a portal to the scientific process because cognitive film theorists have shown, and also cognitive scientists have shown, that our brains are hardwired to think in narrative form. We think in story. Our we take in information in the world and we put it in a time-based narrative. Now that's different than the scientific process, which is, which is something that has to, be, has to be learned. Scientific thinking has to be learned. So what we do with film language is, is we're using particularly close-ups or point-of-view shots to allow the audience to identify with the character on the screen. And that allows people who are unfamiliar or uncomfortable with scientists to sort of see the world from the point of view of the scientist perspective, and that allows us to go on the journey, which is the scientist's journey, and that makes the scientist more relatable, and the scientific process one that a non-science viewer can start to understand. This is, a, again, point of view shot. So you have, you're looking over the shoulder uh, of a scientist, at this point looking at a, at a penguin. Close-up shots uh, allow us to mimic and connect with the emotions on, on the faces of the scientists. This is all control of film language. Now, this is really important that young filmmakers do this. Why? Because as technology is changing, film language is always changing. And that's critical because the film students, the young people, are creating science narratives with stylistic approaches and techniques and editing styles and, and slow motion and all kinds of filmic effects that are compelling to their peers. And it's not the way I would make a story, it's the way they would make a story. And that's really important, because again, if they're connecting to, to these scientists, as they're making the story, that's making them interested in the science, and then they want to communicate that science to, to their, their age group. Again, um, what we're really proud of here is this innovative learning model that is uh, interaction between researchers and, and scientists, and allowing the, the artists to translate the science to a larger 
a larger public. And what we're doing is we're providing motivational goals to the film students because they are authors. They have authorship, they have creative engagement, they have creative control, and they have accountability. They are responsible for communicating and connecting important research like Oscar's research, important research about our changing oceans to the larger world. And that motivates them and makes them feel um, uh, proud and responsible, and it also allows them to really uh, be inspired to make very professional products. Now here is our Antarctic edge. So as Oscar, uh, I'm not sure if Oscar mentioned this, but uh, I guess our, our introdu introducer did. Oscar and I were in Antarctica for um, six weeks. I had the, the great honor of traveling with him and ice photographer Chris Linder. Um, and we brought back hundreds of hours of footage from the long-term ecological research project, which is a research vessel that leaves uh, out of Palmer Station uh, every, every year. Nobody, nobody had ever been on this ship before, and they've been doing this research for 21 years. Now, we brought back the footage, and I was able to shape it with Steve Holloway from our film bureau and 14 of our undergraduates over two years. And now we have uh, a beautiful film that's having a theatrical release at the Quad Cinema in New York on April 17th. It's going to be, uh, have a Los Angeles release in, in May, and we're super proud of this, and we really are very confident that this film is going to have a big impact in terms of communicating important uh, climate research and ocean research to the world and hopefully inspiring people to care more about climate change and take, up, take steps to mitigate climate change. As a researcher, I would say what I'm most excited about is what I've learned about what my students learned making this, making this film because we did surveys with our students before and after their involvement on the film. And what we found is our students who previously said they were uncomfortable with science, they were uncomfortable with scientists, they were intimidated by scientists. Instead, they, they said afterwards that they felt much more comfortable with science, they were inspired by scientists, they were motivated to continue learning science, and they were really, really motivated to communicate important climate and ocean science to their peers. That was really transformative, and that's really, really exciting, uh, exciting to me. And it all starts, again, with this space, this space of intersection uh, between artists and scientists with shared goals and relationships of trust. Thanks, Donna. Just to end, scientists, artists need to collaborate. So anybody in this room, whether they go into law, politics, history, medicine. It's breaking down the barriers between the discipline that's going to allow us to tackle the big problems and challenges facing the next generation. Because they're big, they're real, but I'm actually pretty optimistic about your generation's ability to deal with them. Thank you very much. Thank you.